Justin Trudeau campaigns in Quebec and then meets with seniors. Jagmeet Singh meets with young supporters in Montreal. Andrew Shear makes a stop at a Tim Hortons and an ice rink. It's time to have your say. Welcome to the program. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Thank you for joining us on CPAC. In this final stretch of the 2019 federal election campaign, the Conservatives and the Liberals remain very close in the opinion polls, while the NDP has raised the prospect of a coalition once again. The three party leaders, as you can see, have been campaigning relentlessly. But what's going to happen when Canadians actually cast their ballots next week? We're interested in your predictions and your preferences today. Our question to you, who will win the most seats? Call us at 1-877-296-2722 or tweet us at CPAC underscore TV. You can also email us at haveyoursay at cpac.ca. Joining us today for our discussion are Alex Ballingall of the Toronto Star and journalist and author Dale Smith. Welcome to both of you. Good to be here. So I, I deliberately phrased that question as who's going to win the most seats, not necessarily who's going to form a government, because those could be two different things, Dale. They could be two different things. Um, and our system does allow for this kind of flexibility. Yeah. So, Alex, uh, where do you think things stand at the moment? Uh, it looks like we're in a extremely, if the polls are correct, I guess is the caveat on that. Uh, which Big caveat. And they're all in yeah. the same ballpark. So it, it, by all indications, we're in, we're in a very tight race. Um, heading towards some sort of minority parliament um, where the game could become, as we're seeing in, in the various messaging in the last days here, the game could become, um, you know, a horse trading between policies to support a given party and, and uh, just to, the formation of whatever minority government could be squabbled together, I guess, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Dale, what do you think? Where, where are we at here? Is, it, is, it, uh, is there anything likely to change in the final few days of the campaign, do you think? You never know. Um, polls can suddenly shift in the last few days of a campaign. Um, there's usually some kind of momentum within the last uh, within the last week, so that could start showing up in the polls in the next day or two, uh, because there's usually some lag time. Uh, and after that, it uh, just kind of depends on what the math, or the seat math, is going to be once uh, once the votes are all counted. Yeah, when you look at the poll tracking uh, systems, the, like the one run by. Eric Grenier of the CBC or Philippe J. Fournier who does 338Canada.com. They uh, seem to put the, the aggregate of the polls with the Conservatives around 32 percent, the Liberals around 31 percent. Uh, that in itself is unusual. Uh, I looked it up. I went through every election in Canadian history and there has never been an election where a party, uh, where the party with the highest voter support had less than 35 percent. That was in mm. 1979 with Joe Clark. Uh, there has, but there has never been, at, uh, there's never been a situation where at least one party has not had 35 percent of the popular vote, and we have a party at 32 percent and another at 31 percent right now. So that would be historic. Uh, it would be, but it's also the popular vote wouldn't necessarily reflect what the seat count will be. Sure. We have to remember that some of the weightings regionally are, are very skewed. For example, the Conservatives are polling at something like 64 in Alberta, uh, which gives a different weighting to um, to how many seats they're going to win there as opposed to what they might win in another region. Right. But it means we could end up having a government, though, that 68 percent of Canadians didn't vote for. And I know that's part of the first-past-the-post system, and I know it's not that much different from a government that... 62 or 63 or 65 percent didn't vote for it, but it would be the the it, it would be the government with the smallest amount of popular support in Canadian history, if that's what happens. That is, you know, assuming that we take the the popular vote as something that's real and it's not actually well, it, it is actually right. a logical fallacy yeah, just I'm not, given the way the, the system works. Sure, I'm not I'm not necessarily saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's noteworthy in the sense that. Uh, quite often in an election campaign, at a certain point, people start grouping, you know, there, there's, a, there's some form of consensus and people start migrating towards one party or another and say, oh, okay, they're going to win, uh, this is who I'm supporting, whatever. And in this campaign, neither the Liberals nor the Conservatives have gained any momentum. If anything, they've lost momentum. And we have two par parties that are sort of, depending on your whether you want to call it glass uh, two-thirds empty or glass one-third full, they are equally unpopular or popular. Correct. Yeah, I think that, like, look at just looking at it, 
because uh, if the NDP or the, like, whatever the, the form of a minority government could be, whether it's a formal coalition or whether it's some sort of uh, just support us for now or arrangement, uh, that, that could, you know, 32% of Canadians would vote for one party, but then if you combine a couple, sure. it could get to over yeah. 50, if, if, you, if you consider that being the, the government you voted for, I guess. So, so it depends on how you look at it yeah. a little bit, I think. Again, I'm not saying it's a problem. I'm just saying I think it's interesting that we're, we're having an election where this is going to be the end result. It, mm -hmm. it may lead to great government at the end of the day. We don't know. But there is uh, clearly uh, a rejection of the Conservatives and the Liberals like we have not seen before. Not on the federal level. I mean, we're seeing uh, aspects of this playing out in some provinces where, there have, where they've had uh, hung parliaments in their own legislatures. Yep. Um, and, you know, there are how many, I think it's three or four now, which are in some kind of a minority situation, um, you know, governing with the cooperation of a, of a small or upstart party. Yeah, and I, I think others have said this is an election that so far seems to be less about who you want and more about who you don't want, and maybe that's reflected in the low numbers for the Liberals and the Conservatives right now, right? Yeah, it does seem to be the, 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 the two main parties, for whatever reason, yeah. That's interesting, the historic low, at least at the federal level. Um, I'd be interested to know what, what exactly, it could be the, the sort of the, the tenor of the campaign being so negative and with, with the right. attacks and just... Uh, you know, less focus on policy, more sort of on personality or, or uh, accusations and stuff like yeah. that. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to see that those numbers for sure. So Justin Trudeau today accused the Conservatives of running the dirtiest campaign ever. Um, is that is that fair? Is that what's going on here? Because there have been certainly dirtier, there are, I, I don't want to say dirtier, there have been dirty campaigns or negative campaigns if you want to use that word. I don't want to, uh, dirty is a little more... Uh, of a subjective term, but there have been mm -hmm. negative campaigns in the past. Uh, the 2015 election, uh, big theme of that was Justin Trudeau, according to the Conservatives, not being ready. There have been scare tactics and fe fear mongering about Stephen Harper in the past, about Stefan Dion, about Michael Ignatieff. So is this campaign so unusual? Um, for me, I think it's not so much dirty in terms of personal attacks, but what I f have found throughout this particular election more than any other is the capacity for people to kind of treat truth as, as a bit of a, an afterthought uh, is, is much more so in this uh, particular election I found than, than in previous ones. So you, you think politicians are lying more now than they uh, have in the past? In, in my uh, expert opinion, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that might be like, that's, that's interesting because it, it could be like a social media effect. Like it's, it's, so, it's so easy. For yeah, like, it's social media we've amplifying We've seen like false that. stories kind of poke into the mainstream and get picked up by political parties. Um, and political parties amplifying conspiracy theories. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm no expert either, but it does yeah. se that does seem like a, a novel thing. So let's walk through what happens, Dale, if there isn't a majority government next week. Uh, what? Just tell us what... You know what, what the process will be. The process will be is that Justin Trudeau remains the prime minister because the he has not signaled an intention to resign. Um, so until he does so, he remains the prime minister, and he gets unless he says on election night, I call yeah. to congratulate Andrew Scheer, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. So he will remain prime minister until he makes the decision to resign, uh, and at that point he can test the house um, in whatever configuration he, he he chooses so if he doesn't have the most seats then he can go approach the other parties and say will you support us for or, you know 18 months two years whatever that tends to be the life of a, of a minority parliament and you know try and hammer out some kind of agreement with them um, this you know there's a lot of talk about how this is up to the governor general and it's really not her role is mostly just to be a fire extinguisher in all of this. Um, it's not until um, the incumbent makes the uh, decision to, that he will resign that she plays a role in right. in naming uh, who the next one will be. And she doesn't have a lot of choices to make either. It's pretty straightforward that if this happens, she does this, and if that happens, she does that. That's right? generally how it works. Yeah. yeah. I guess she could. Could she call an election as well? Like. It, it, that would be her. That that would be, but it's it'd be exceedingly rare. Particularly to have one right after another. There tends to be a, the the consensus in in Canadian governors general has tended to be about six months um, waiting period. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, uh, the Justin Trudeau would have the first crack at it basically, and he could uh, try to negotiate uh, the support of other parties, uh, and then at some point present a throne speech and see if that passes. 
Um, we've certainly, you know, we, we just saw the example in British Columbia that's worth citing where Christy Clark uh, tried to uh, introduce a throne speech and it was defeated. She knew it was going to be defeated, but she went through the exercise anyway. Right. And, you know, didn't want to concede defeat before, before it actually happened. Right. So, so yeah. we could see a similar situation like that here. Yeah. And uh, I think that a similar um, uh, a pro sequence of events happened in 1985 in Ontario as well with uh, the Liberals and the NDP defeating the Progressive Conservatives in Ontario. Right. Uh, so that, that can happen. Uh, and again, we should remind people, the party with the highest number of seats, uh, unless it's a majority, doesn't necessarily get to form a government, and that's not the wrong outcome. It, and it's, it's not illegitimate in any way. <clears throat> right. Despite what some party leaders will try to claim in order to kind of <clears throat> find a moral authority to, to govern at that point. Yeah. But Alex, there are important nuances, right? If you've, got, if you've got a party that came close to a majority or if there's a gap of a significant number of seats between the first place party and the second place party, I think it makes it harder for that second party to, to kind of claim legitimacy if it forms a government with some of the others. I think that's true in, in the arena of, of public opinion, potentially, but, but in, in, the, in the, uh, the confines of what's uh, technically permissible in our, in our uh, parliamentary democracy, it, it, it's, right. it, that difference doesn't matter. But I think there are the nuances play in when, when the public is looking at this, when the politicians are making arguments about what, what should be perceived as legitimate. That's where all that comes into play, I think. Yeah. So let me put this out there, and we're, again, asking for your predictions on the outcome of this election, on who will win the most seats, basically, but any other predictions that you have. Um, but And a lot of people are saying because it's so close, it's very difficult to predict. Uh, and certainly, when you're looking at national numbers, it's hard to know how that translates into the various races across the country that will actually decide the outcome of this election, because it isn't a national vote. It's a series of votes in 338 ridings, some of which may have two-way, three-way, or even four-way races that would be hard to predict at this point, given some of the dynamics around the national numbers. Um, but it's looking increasingly like a majority is not going to happen. Right? Is that fair to say? I mean, with if you've got two parties at if, if the 32, poll numbers are correct, yeah, yeah. assuming they've they're pretty, correct, that's what it looks they've like. They've been yeah. pretty consistent, yeah. though. And it, now again, something could change between now and Monday as well. But if it's if it's not a majority government, then I would put out there that the odds of Justin Trudeau continuing to be prime minister as the outcome of this election are pretty high, because we've already seen the NDP and the Green Party, effectively saying they won't support Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives. So even though the numbers might be hard to predict, is it, is it fair to say that the, the outcome is now becoming more apparent that it's, it's probably the most likely scenario that Justin Trudeau is still Prime Minister in a month? I think that's a likely scenario. Um, I don't know. Most likely, I mean, it, it's hard to say a week out because a week is a long time in politics. Yeah. I guess like the, the wild so card So five days that. is... is <laughs> Almost a long time. It's a lifetime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but the block, like uh, the, I, I, the, the NDP and, and the Greens have, have, well, the NDP has blatantly ruled it out, and the Greens have by implication ruled it out, supporting the Conservatives, I mean. Yeah. Uh, but the block hasn't, as far as, as far as I understand it. So if their sort of momentum surge, whatever you want to call it, uptick, continues and gets them the balance of power, then, then I think we could see a Conservative minority survive. It would be difficult, though, I think, for the Conservatives to um, approach uh, uh, some kind of an arrangement with the bloc, basically with a straight face, considering the level of rhetoric that happened in 2008, uh, when the bloc would have held you know, some kind of a, uh, a role in the proposed coalition at that time. Yeah. Uh, just to have some fun with math, again, Eric Grenier's poll tracking and seat projection formula has the Liberals winning 135 seats. Now, of course, they, they all portray a range for this, but the sweet spot in that range is 135 seats. The Conservatives, 132. The NDP, 34. The Bloc, 33. And the Green Party, 4. Which means that no combination of two parties, other than the Liberals and the Conservatives teaming up, which is not going to happen, no combination of two parties would total the 170 needed to have a majority of the seats in the House of Commons, which would suddenly shift... Uh, a lot of uh, power to uh, Green Party leader Elizabeth May, wouldn't it? Uh, it's it's entirely theory. possible. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, again, that's one scenario. It's based on the most recent polling data. That could change. It could fluctuate quite a bit. But it is interesting that the Liberals and the NDP add up to 169. The Conservatives and the Bloc adds up to 165. So nobody's even getting to 170 with a second party as part of mm -hmm. the mix. So... That That'll is be, interesting. It'd be fun to watch if that yeah. <laughs> if that goes down. Yeah. 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 The other thing I why I think that could be interesting is on you know a, a, a minority parliament will often uh, judge things on an issue by issue basis. <clears throat> so I think there could be places where the conservatives might be more keen to cooperate with the liberals on things like, for example, that Trans Mountain pipeline. If the other parties want to want to kill it. Conservatives might, you know, uh, hold their noses and vote with the Liberals in order to keep it alive. So that is always one of those kinds of strange things that might always happen in that kind of a situ situation. Yeah, we talked a lot about the possibility of a coalition government yesterday, uh, but it doesn't need to be a coalition. Stephen Harper never had a formal coalition, and he had a couple of minority uh, governments uh, and uh, then a majority government, of course. But during the time that he had a minority government, he just governed issue by issue and found the votes to support whatever he was putting across, and that worked, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, um, and I just was going to say something else, and now it's okay. it's escaped. So, Sorry. Uh, what about the theory that minority parliaments are better in some way? Are they inherently better, or is that, or do, are we just pointing to a few examples of when they? have produced good results like the, the days of uh, Lester B. Pearson with the flag and Medicare and pension reform and so on? I, I think that is cherry picking to a certain extent and there was, um, it was kind of a mood of the country at the time. I don't know that we are able to replicate that mood to the same extent today. Um, I think, you know, with it, it would likely be issue by issue. Um, and I remember what I was going to say was, uh, was that coalitions are, are very difficult because it generally involves people from other parties being in the cabinet, right. and that creates problems around things like cabinet solidarity. Yeah. And we talked yesterday about how the junior partner in a lot of coalitions ends up uh, paying a price in the next election. It doesn't always work out for them. So many, a party like the NDP would probably want to stay outside a coalition and support a government issue by issue and then still be able to criticize that government when it wants to, right? I think that, that like all that sort of a political calculus is why we've never seen except for the world war one example where it right. was sort of a just a solidarity exercise we've never seen a formal coalition yeah. I, I think because it's never really made but, sense politically but we've seen them in our system right so in yeah. provincial governments we've seen it in uh, britain we've seen it there's mm -hmm. yeah. uh, been uh, some recent examples of that in the uk uh, so it can happen in the westminster system yeah, it's, it's technically possible and totally permissible, but it's, yeah. it's just never made sense to the parties, I guess. Right. Yeah. And it yeah. would have to depend on the political calculus of the day. Yeah. And, and that's what's going to happen next week in a lot of ways, right? Is, uh, and and I, I will reinforce the fact, I've been making this point before, but uh, what they're saying now and what they do next week might be two different things. Because right now, whatever they say is about getting votes, and next week, whatever they do will be about what makes the most sense at that time, right? Right, and that's why I think it's always kind of foolish to start uh, putting your red lines out for agreements uh, before the we even know what the seat count is. Right. All right, interested in your views on our question today about who will win the election? Let's take a call from Joseph in Winnipeg. Hello, Joseph. I'm, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm picking... Uh... At the end, uh, people will decide right at the end that they're uh, voting... Uh, and right now it's uh, up, being a poll that they're pretty close, <coughs> excuse me, but I think at the end people are going to say we got a screwball of a thing coming up. I think I'll vote Liberal and I think Justin will get a majority. Okay, so you think it'll be a Liberal majority at the end of this? I think uh, people will come to their senses, so to speak, and say we don't want that bunch of mix-up, what they're trying to possess in Canada, and I think Canadians will come to their, and say, their sane thinking and uh, put Trudeau back in. A lot of people don't like him, but they'll put him back in. Okay, thank you for your call. Debbie in Lethbridge, Alberta. Hello, Debbie. Hi, how are you today? Good, thank you. Good. Go ahead. I'm, a, I'm of course, from Western Canada where you know that uh, a lot of people know that it's progressive conservatives, especially Calgary. 
I just feel that it will probably be a minority, and I feel that that will favor Justin Trudeau. Okay. So you, um, you expect a minority parliament, and you think that Justin Trudeau will emerge from that leading the I government? I do, and um, the, I was just watching it on TV here, and when so many people are saying, pass the post, pass the post, one thing that people in Canada have to realize it was the Progressive Conservative Party that implemented that, that put that in, because it favors a party. Well, First Pass the Post has been around longer than uh, Canada has been around, right? So it's not the Conservatives necessarily that put that system in place in this country. It's a, it's, we, we adopted it using the British system. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. But my thing is here being in Lethbridge, like, I mean, um, you know, we have never had like somebody like Andrew Scheer or, you know, these um, leaders come to our city and, you know, come door knocking. I have lived in Lethbridge for 15 years and our MP for the Progressive Conservative well, the UPCs now, you never see her unless you go to pancake breakfasts or small-town rodeos. And I think that's totally wrong. Okay. Debbie, thank you very much for your call. Sandra in Ottawa. Hello, Sandra. Hey, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, yes, in my opinion, uh, the majority will be for the conservative. And... Um, and I think that uh, he is going to be the el next elected prime minister because I think that uh, they are more responsible for uh, the balance of the budget and they are going to cut the expenditure. And I think that most of the Canadian want a change. And I think that because, maybe because he is um, very responsible, is a person that is coming from a working family. And I think 100% that he's going to be the next prime minister. So you're predicting a conservative majority? Uh, correct. Okay. Sandra, thank you for your call. Michael in Glace Bay, Nova Scotia. Hello, Michael. Mark. Hi. I think uh, who's going to win the most seats are the liberals and the conservatives because either one's in or one's out. But I think after 150 year, years this country existed, I think the sheep in the barnyard are finally starting to wake up, and I like the message that's coming across in honesty from Joe B. Singh. I, I like, I'm in DP now for sure. There's no doubt about it. I haven't voted yet, but I, with all my hope, I got my fingers and my toes crossed that come election night that we end up with no less than the minority government because I, I believe honestly in my heart that the sheep in the farmyard that are finally start becoming informed will get the justice that they deserve and start getting the, the piece of the pie in this country that's rightfully theirs for the taxes and the sacrifices that they made all their life. And, and, and that's my opinion anyway, Mark. That's all I can hope for. Remember I told you there two weeks ago we were in the last half mile of the horse race? Well, now we're in the last quarter of the horse race and Mr. Singh is closing fast. And there's a lot of rich people peeking out their windows, scared to death. But don't be scared. It's time to share the wealth. I'll talk to you later, buddy. Okay, thank you. Bernie yep. in Mississauga. Hello, Bernie. I called you in the first week, and you asked me what the threshold for the, the NDP would be. And I said 24 25%. Right now, he's pulling close to the 20% mark. If there's a move... In the electorate in the last week, I think that, that uh, Jugweek Singh will be the story of this election. I think uh, Trudeau let a lot of people down. He was given a massive majority, and he made a lot of promises he didn't fulfill and on, the, on the world stage and also domestically. As far as the Conservatives, they had, they've got about five provincial governments across the country now. So to the people of Ontario... When you go to cast your ballot, it's a secret ballot, and the only one that's created any enthusiasm in this election, as far as I can see, is Jagmeet Singh. So, flow with your heart and use your mind too. 
Okay, Bernie, thank you very much for your call. Marcel in saint hyacinthe Quebec. Oui. Oui, bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour. C'est à propos de, du régime de quatre ans de monsieur Trudeau. Oui. Euh, et puis des contrats qui ont été alloués à la Nouvelle-Écosse au montant de 50 milliards de dollars, tout au même, rien aux autres. Les chantiers de lévis lozon en avaient besoin, mais il ne s'est pas occupé de ça. Fait que le Québec est seul, toujours seul. Fait qu'on n'a pas le choix de voter pour euh, M. Blanchet. Moi, c'est mon opinion, vous m'excuserez, mais je vous remercie, messieurs. OK, merci. Oh, oui. Sherry in, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Jeff in Hamilton. Hello, Jeff. Hamilton, Ontario. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. First of all, I don't go by anybody's speculation who's going to win. Everybody has their own opinion. My opinion is Monday, it'll be a liberal majority government. He's the only prime minister in the last 15, 20 years that's done anything good for the country, getting jobs, helping the poor, not starve to death, helping veterans, helping everybody. Like they say, you have to spend money to make money. He's done great on the world stage. He got rid of the uh, tariffs on the steel with Christy Freeland. I mean, like, if everybody listens to all the uh, PC negative and scare tactics of a joint, uh, joint government between them and the NDP and higher taxes, and that's, that's a load of bunk. But anyway, if anybody's trashed the election, it's Andrew Sherry. You'll see a majority on Monday of the Liberal government. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, talk about a couple of things that came up during those calls. Um, is there a chance, do you think, that there will be some support that drifts back to the Liberals in the final days of the campaign, Alex? Is that a possibility? I think, yeah, I think it, it, it is a possibility. Um, they're certainly hoping so, I think, with the, the hammering away at this message of, uh, you know, a vote, for, a vote for the NDP, a vote for the Greens, uh, is a vote for Andrew Scheer. I think that they've been basically making just like naked pitches for strategic voting, and, and yeah. for a lot of people on the left side of the spectrum, that 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 could catch fire because there are fears of of what the conservatives would do in government. On but that, that side but, of the but spectrum. that would be a more credible argument if the conservatives were flirting with a majority, right? If they're at 32 percent, it's harder to convince NDP supporters that they have to vote liberal in order to stop Andrew Scheer, right? I mean, it depends on, on the vote splits in, in every riding. So it could take just small movements in a handful of ridings that could shift things uh, more dramatically one way or the other. Um, we're in that kind of a tight situation right now. So I, I think that's why they're kind of hammering on this message. And they're also um, hammering a lot on getting out the vote right now. And that's already started. Um, more than, I think, a little more than in, in past elections, at least the ones coming knocking on my door anyway. Yeah. Is there a risk, Alex, that if the Conservatives win the most seats but don't form a government, that that is uh, going to uh, cause a lot of uh, concern in Western Canada in particular? Uh, yeah, I think there would be, if that exact scenario, ha I think there would be a lot of upset people in the prairies, and especially Alberta, I guess. Um, th that and I and I, I can't predict this, but I you know with Sheer obviously already warning of this this uh, tax and spend NDP Liberal coalition that could just sort of seize power in a minority parliament. Um, I could see them continuing to make that argument, and and that could uh, you know, further inflame those resentments. Yeah, Dale, what do you think? I, I think that's certainly possible as well. Um, uh, I think if that is the case, the Liberals will kind of have to. Um, Pay particular attention to to trying to um, put out some of those fires in in Alberta and Saskatchewan in particular, in terms of reassuring them that yes, that pipeline is still going to go through. Yes, we are not abandoning the oil sector, um, and they're going to have to be very clear about that. And that um, is going to cause, uh, I think, some of their potential coalition or not coalition, but cooperation partners in in the NDP and the Greens. Uh, some consternation. So I think that's what's going to make things uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to check in with CPAC social media analyst Winston C and find out what's happening on social media. Winston, good to talk to you again. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, Mark. So we saw a bit of a boost for Liberal leader Justin Trudeau on Twitter today. Uh, let's talk about that. 
Yeah, this just happening in the last half hour where uh, former President Barack Obama in the U.S. Uh, tweeting quite the endorsement for Justin Trudeau uh, at last check. This was trending around number three, uh, but definitely climbing its way up in Canada. Some, him saying, I, I was proud to work with Justin Trudeau as president. He's a hardworking, effective leader who takes on big issues like climate change. The world needs his progressive leadership now, and I hope our neighbors to the north support him for another term. Uh, this, of course, uh, getting quite a few likes right now. I'm just going to refresh the page. It's going to show that there's about 41 uh, and a half thousand likes already and quite a few retweets skimming through some of the initial comments already. Uh, you're seeing comments on both sides. You're seeing people praising the uh, former president for endorsing this, especially in such an important time. Uh, but there are many other people who are saying this is a bit of a, a foreign election meddling as well. So, Interesting to see how the initial reaction is off the get-go, but we'll see this develop for sure. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, imagine uh, the reaction uh, with different people involved, for example, right? Imagine if, uh, if former President Bush had written a tweet like that about Stephen Harper, or if a Canadian prime minister wrote a tweet like that about uh, an American presidential candidate. Uh, we might see all kinds of different reactions. Yeah, in a lot of ways, their po their politics are quite similar. So you see an interesting endorsement there. But should should the situation be different, where it was a conservative prime minister, uh, you know, what would that situation be like? Yeah. So uh, definitely interesting to see there. All right, millions of Canadians, of course, spent their Thanksgiving weekend voting in the advance polls. Uh, do you think social media was a factor in that? Well, social media definitely gave people an important uh, you know, reminder to get out to the advanced polls. There's some really interesting conversations as well as to the advanced voting period. Of course, this was Canadian Thanksgiving. A lot of people had the opportunity to speak with their family members and make an informed vote, or maybe not such an informed vote. Uh, but, you know, there were some interesting comments, too, as to whether the period should be made a little bit longer so that people could get to the poll, given the record of voter turnout there uh, for the advanced polls. Scott saying approximately one quarter of the votes have already been cast. The extended poll hours over the Thanksgiving weekend made voting conditions convenient will be interesting to see if overall voting is up or if we're just voting it in advance. Lori saying, uh, honestly, I didn't even realize bans polled for open and I'm more engaged in this election than any other. I'm 43 and live in Winnipeg. Perhaps it wasn't announced as predominantly because of the winter storm that blasted, uh, you know, much of that part of the country last week. Uh, Die saying, uh, having so many days of advanced voting with convenient hours works well done everyone. So maybe that is the solution to increase voter turnout. And one other vote, uh, video I want to show you, Mark, uh, is this video. This is from yeah. an 18-year-old in, uh, in uh, Manitoba really urging people to get out to the polls, saying this is my last chance to make a difference. She's uh, living and, and suffering from a terminal ca cancer, terminal illness, and she wants to make an, a difference by reminding people to get out and vote, and that's what she's saying there with those signs. Yeah, she in fact uh, says if she can do it, uh, there's no excuse for anyone else, right? Yeah, and that video has garnered over 500,000 views. Can find the time to vote? You can find the time to vote. There it is, 500,000 views on Twitter. Wow. Um, so uh, just out of curiosity, did you uh, and your family talk a lot about the election at Thanksgiving dinner or at any other gathering on the weekend? Well, po politics definitely came up. Uh, I think it's one of those fine lines. There are families who don't really touch it at all. My family tends to discuss politics from a sense of how the conversation is different in different parts of the, the, the province here in Ontario. Uh, I live right in this, the, the city, of, in, the, in the downtown of Toronto, whereas many of my other family members live in the suburbs. And it's interesting to see that 416-905 divide and how that shifts in the, the political conversation. Yeah, because it didn't come up at all at my Thanksgiving dinner. Just I, I waited and waited for uh, somebody to raise it, and it didn't, and I didn't bring it up. So... That was fine, too. So uh, you've been uh, showing us some really interesting graphs so that uh, depict the trends in terms of who's searching for what on social media. So as we enter the final stretch of this campaign, the final few days, uh, what has been driving those searches? 
Well, it is definitely interesting to see what things were like seven days ago and uh, what things are like today. The first picture I'm going to show uh, is of the leader search percentage. So you see, this is over the last seven days where Justin Trudeau has 41% of searches, but then Jagmeet Singh really starting to gain traction at 27% of the searches, actually uh, beating out Andrew Scheer for number two. But then the next image, uh, leader search ranked, shows Jagmeet Singh actually at the top as of uh, today at 9 a.m., at around 49 of that, uh, Andrew Scheer at 33 and Justin Trudeau at 31. So Jagmeet Singh continuing to get tra and gain traction when it comes to the searches and the conversation, uh, according to Google. And then the last image here is of the region and where conversations are trending, uh, according to province. So in British Columbia, still very much a green conversation as well as up to the north. Uh, here in Ontario, it's uh, definitely a much more co conservative kind of a conversation and in Quebec, the Bloc Québécois. But there's no red to be seen anywhere yeah. on that map. So That's uh, we'll see how that changes leading up to Monday, for yeah, sure. Yeah, you showed us that map a couple of weeks ago, and it was there was a lot of red on the map, and now there's none, right? There was a lot of red a few weeks ago, and then we saw a bit of an orange wave uh, as we were in the debates week. And then now the red isn't even on the map. So by the time the weekend and Monday rolls around, I'm sure that'll be very different. Yeah. All right, coming up on Have Your Say, we're going to be taking a look at how Indigenous issues have been a part of this election and to some extent how they have not been a part of the election. So what have you seen on social media on that subject? Well, there's been a lot of interesting conversation, especially around the Indigenous uh, topics with the uh, debates and whether the issues were really discussed and people were quite vocal about it. Priscilla saying, as an Indigenous voter, it has been hard to be inspired by federal party leaders, but the best chance we have of positive change is to elect the best person we can to work with us. So, you know, who are you going to pick? Is it a matter of picking the right leader or is it a matter of picking who you uh, want to represent you that isn't who you don't want to represent you? Uh, Marianne saying, wait, Jagmeet Singh has been moralizing uh, all election about Indigenous issues, but he hasn't made it to Nunavut. So, uh, you know, uh, we've been talking about this regionalization, uh, rather regionalism, and whether leaders have gotten to the right parts of the country, and she feels that uh, Jagmeet Singh hasn't taken enough of an opportunity to head up north. Dakota saying, take away from the Conservative Party's Indigenous platform points no mention of First Nations, lumped into greater Indigenous group, no mention of treaty. They're going to maintain current funding levels for First Nation issues. So it doesn't sound like Dakota is going to be supporting the Conservatives. And one last one uh, from at Harass No More. Singh got it right on Indigenous issues beyond lots of lofty talk and bold-faced assertions of making lives better. Successive Liberal and Conservative governments have largely chosen to ignore the concerns of Canada's First Peoples. Okay. Very interesting stuff, Winston. I appreciate uh, having your insights on what's happening on social media today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. CPAC social media analyst Winston C., who's been with us throughout the campaign here on Have Your Say. And again, in the second half of the program, we are going to be asking your thoughts for your thoughts on Indigenous issues, and we'll have some special guests for that discussion. So let's come back to a couple of things that Winston raised. Uh, Barack Obama's tweet Dale, what do you think about that? It seems to me that that is a direct appeal to progressive voters in Canada, including New Democrats and Green Party supporters, to uh, give Justin Trudeau a second chance. It does seem to be how it reads. It was kind of a surprise to have heard that. And, and as he was talking, I, I checked uh, my own Twitter feed, and it's all over there right now. So it's, it's interesting how in the 35 minutes we've been on the air that that's kind of blown up uh, mm -hmm. all around us. But I, I think it is, it's a, it's fairly unusual, it's fairly unprecedented, I think, to have uh, a former American president um, kind of insert himself into the Canadian election in this kind of way. Yeah, you can see the tweet there from uh, Barack Obama. Alex, uh, what do you make of that? Will it, will it make a difference? I, uh, Barack Obama is a very popular figure in Canada. He speaks here regularly and draws uh, significant crowds when he does, and very supportive crowds as well. I was at an event where he spoke in Ottawa a couple months ago, and people were kind of eating out of his hands in terms of the messages that he was sharing. Uh, so do you think it'll make a difference? It could. He does have, the, like you say, that, that sort of progressive star power. Um, 
for a lot of voters. Uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I really don't know. I think some people will be turned off by it. Um, they'll see it as, as a former president sort of inserting himself in, into the election debate. Some people will love it. And I guess maybe the way it could make a difference is if there's liberal leaning voters who would feel uninspired by our election, maybe they would see an endorsement like that and say, well, maybe, you know, JT's not so bad and we should get out and vote. So, yeah. so it could make a difference, but, but um, it could also just do nothing. Yeah, I think the, the way it's phrased is really interesting uh, because it's in the context of global affairs, which, of course, on the one hand, gives Barack Obama, in theory, license to talk about it. But on the other hand, it also, I think, is an attempt to provide some perspective to Canadians who maybe have gotten, from the perspective of the Liberals and their supporters, wrapped up in the minutia of this campaign and gives them an opportunity to kind of take a step back and see it from an outsider's perspective, right? That might be the how liberals would frame this to try to get support as a result of it. Well, yeah, and it's it's also I think there's there's an element of of saying, you know, look at this this kind of outside figure who thinks that we've been doing a good job. And when one of the narratives that the Conservatives has been trying to push is that, liber uh, you know, Justin Trudeau has been some kind of grand embarrassment uh, on the world stage, this kind of knocks some of the wind out of that sail. Yeah. That uh, makes you wonder, does it not, Alex, whether there's been a conversation between uh, Justin Trudeau and Barack Obama since the blackface scandal erupted? Because uh, he was the, um, uh, of course, is the only black president of the United States. They were close. We knew that beforehand. But uh, I don't think anybody ever sort of gauged what Barack Obama's reaction was to that story surfacing. Yeah, that's a, that's interesting, actually. That, that, that thought sort of popped into my head, too, like in, in terms of... Uh, that that sort of chapter of this election campaign does an endorsement from somebody like this um, somehow play into like right. moving on from that for Justin Trudeau? Yeah, uh, maybe for some people it would. Yeah, yeah. But again, imagine if uh, former President George Bush was endorsing Andrew Scheer right now. I, I think there would be a much different reaction from a lot of Canadians. There would be, but I think that also has to do with the differences between the American parties uh, as, as compared to the Canadian ones. I don't think there's quite something so an, as analogous. Um, uh, between them and and you know the, the kind of joke is that the Democrats are, are often to the right of the conservatives in Canada right um, and so I, I think that um, you know if it was someone maybe from, not Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders but yeah yeah but but yeah the mainstream right. uh, essentially but yep. I but I think that does kind of play in a little bit in that um, the way in which the Republican Party in the states uh, as viewed in Canada is, is very different from from how the Democrats are viewed yeah. All right. Uh, we uh, also heard about voter turnout in that segment. Alex, what are your thoughts on this surprisingly high voter turnout? 4.7 million Canadians voted in the advance polls. Uh, is that a sign that voter turnout is going to be higher than expected, or is it simply that people are discovering advance polls more so in this election than in previous ones? I think they've been advertised and promoted a little bit more. Um, and uh, I think there's been an evolution that once upon a time, advance polls were something you went to only if you knew for sure you'd be out of town on election day to now being a, one of the days you can vote, effectively as, as legitimate as the day itself. Um, and, and also just that, hey, if you've got a window of four days on a long weekend where you can go vote, that might actually be more convenient and easier to pull off than, than a weekday where your kids are in school and you're making dinner and going to work. Yeah, I think uh, that could very well be the case, but we, we won't know, obviously, until the final uh, yeah. the ballots are counted. But uh, I, w I was a bit, I think the, the convenience argument makes sense to me because I, I was a bit surprised by, given, given all the talk we've had about the negative campaign, people are turned off, nobody, you know, everyone's looking for a policy that speaks to them and can't find it. And then to see sort of that uptick was surprising. So it may have to do with the convenience thing, but, but again, we won't know until after Election Day. Yeah, Dale, what do you think? I, I think it's significant that um, some of the Election Act changes that uh, went through in the last year gave Elections Canada a lot more uh, leeway to advertise and to promote um, the act of voting and, and things like advanced polling. And we did see in the previous election where there was a much greater emphasis on things like setting up polls on campus, where we saw a big uptick there. And I think this is just kind of carrying some, some of that same momentum forward. 
you know, they've kind of learned that this is a good way, or by, by structuring them in these polls in this certain way, um, that they're getting more students, for example, out to them. And I think that this is um, just kind of taking those lessons and, and possibly, you know, right. taking them to the next step. Yeah, which means that if uh, that you, you can't read into the voter turnout results just uh, a conclusion about the level of interest people have in the election because the because elections Canada is doing things to try to promote voting and if there is a change in voter turnout it may uh, have as much to do with that as people's interest in the election right right and I think it's just because there have been those changes that you know they weren't allowed to do the same kind of advertising push in previous elections the the conservative changes to the previous elections act um, were under the the rubric that it's up to parties to get people out at, to vote and not elections Canada and that's kind of changed this right. time around so I think that uh, that might have an impact it does make me wonder whether we can and should move to having uh, more than just an election day in Canada and uh, having the polls open for a few days, uh, in theory, because uh, effectively that's what we have now. A lot, uh, obviously a lot of Canadians have already voted. Uh, you could create a bigger window, leave the opportunity open for, for more people to vote. It's a possibility. There are logistical considerations around what the blackout periods for things like polls, for advertising, for leaders doing tours, that kind of thing, the longer it is. So um, right. that, you know, there would be that consideration to take in, in, in as well. But, but, you know, the thing I find interesting is for those people who voted during the Thanksgiving weekend, uh, those rules didn't apply, right? They, the idea that, okay, you can't publish new polls on Election Day uh, well, you can publish a new poll on a day that 4.7, or a weekend, that 4.7 million Canadians are voting. So why are there different rules around that than on the actual election day itself? You, that, these are kinds, the kinds of things I think that they might need to revisit if more people start going to the advanced polls. Because again, the advanced polls seem to be migrating from something that was there. Look, if, if you absolutely can't vote on election day, we're going to provide a facility for you to be out or, you know, on a different day and cast your ballot, but you really should vote on election day, to now the message being, this is one of the days that you can vote. You're, it's perfectly legitimate. In fact, it, well, why not get it over with? Go out there and vote. You've got a huge window on Thanksgiving weekend. Get out there, cast your ballot. Well, then, if we're encouraging people to do that, then effectively we've created five election days instead of one. I think the difference there, though, is that the people who are doing the advanced polls are much more committed, and whereas the people who wait for election day might are might be waiting and are still weighing their decision, and and I think that um, that has some some significance as well. Yeah, but it does make you wonder why there are a bunch of rules about what you can and can't do on election day, but they don't apply to the advanced polls. If if uh, if almost five million Canadians are going to vote in the advanced polls, why are we making that distinction between those two periods? We're, 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 yeah, I think you're right. We're, we're sort of en route to a multi-day yeah. election day or whatever, election week or whatever you want to call well, it. Well, I, I think it day. could be argued we're already yeah, there. If, yeah. I, if almost 5 million Canadians are voting yeah, before election day, then, then there isn't an election day anymore. There's election days. Mm -hmm. There's uh, Thanksgiving weekend and then October 21st. And, and there are people who will put forward the notion that um, they don't like advanced polls because... Um, it means that people are voting without a complete picture because the campaign isn't over yet. So there is that argument to be put forward as well. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's take a call. By the way, we're standing by for Liberal leader Justin Trudeau, who's at a campaign event in Quebec. You're looking at a live picture of that now. As soon as he begins speaking there, we will go there live here on CPAC. Uh, but first, let's take a call from Marie, who is joining us from London, Ontario. Hello, Marie. Hi, Marie. Marie, are you there? Yes. Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that I think that the Conservatives will get the... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes. Yeah. I think that the Conservatives will get the, um, the most seats. In fact, you'll be shocked. I think they're going to get a majority government. Even though the polls say that that there's not going to be a majority, I think that everyone's going to be shocked, and they will get a, a majority, just like what happened in the States. Nobody thought Trump would win, but he did. So also, I'm, I'm really upset that Obama interfered in the elections, and um, he and Justin Trudeau are good friends, 
And I think that Obama ruined the states when he was there. He caused a lot of problems, and he changed the trajectory of the states. And uh, then, then Trump had to come, up, come in and clean up some of the mess. But I don't think Obama uh, should have interfered. It's none of his business. Okay, thank you very much for your call. Joseph in Fort Erie, Ontario. Hello, Joseph. How are you? Good, thank you. I, uh, yeah, I wanted to phone and answer your question there. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, of course, we don't know, you know, what the exact outcome's going to be, but uh, I'm hoping for a liberal majority. I'm hoping that they get the most seats. Um, and, uh, 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 from what the lady just said about Obama, that was simply, I'm sure, a friendly call to Justin and, you know, wishing him the best. Uh, there was nothing wrong with it. Uh, uh, that attitude she had was unbelievable. And speaking of attitude, I, I, I don't know if you watched the the um, sheer uh, uh, the thing this morning in Essex, that was unbelievable. He was throwing personal attacks again, as he always does. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, him and his cohorts are the ones that have caused such a negative uh, campaign, and I'm so sick and tired of them. Every day, every day, uh, the only time Prime Minister Trudeau uh, uh, he speaks back, and it's never a personal attack, but rather he speaks back when uh, Sheer starts at him, and he speaks back to uh, 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 tell the crowd that that's not true. And, and uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I would do the same thing, but for okay. sure, that was unbelievable today. All right, Joseph. It's Thank you. I appreciate your call. Let's go to Bev in Sarnia, Ontario. Hello, Bev. Yes. Good afternoon. How Hi. are you? Good. Thank you. Well, I guess I can't help but agree, uh, not fully, with uh, the, the lady from Ottawa, I think it was, who thought, the prime minister, or the president, ex-president of the United States, are way off base. I mean, it, it was for public consumption, or he wouldn't have tweeted. Uh, I think that's despicable. I, I, I've seen the the people I know in this riding have, which will be solid conservative. I think for Mrs. Gladu, I think like that woman said that in the last few days has kind of changed around. I'll tell you two things why. Okay, I very very quickly, please, because we're going to have to go back. Well, to might win a majority. But when Trudeau goes back in the closet to bring back dear old butts in the campaign, and there isn't much ruckus about that, uh, you know, we strangled yeah. two very Okay, Bev, I'm going to jump ladies. in. I apologize for cutting you off, but uh, we have to go to a live event now again. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau is campaigning in Quebec, meeting with seniors while campaigning for the local candidate there, Marie Chantal ML. Let's go there live. Je viens hein, de faire le tour de la salle et de vous rencontrer euh, tous et chacun. Euh, mais je veux dire à quel point j'apprécie d'être ici avec vous, surtout avec ma femme Sophie qui est extraordinaire. Et, euh, vous savez, la politique, euh, c'est souvent une affaire de famille. Donc de pouvoir euh, être ici avec ma, euh, ma conjointe, ma partenaire, c'est vraiment apprécié. Je te passe la parole. Bonjour tout le monde. Vous savez pas à quel point, depuis le début qu'on est en politique, ça fait presque dix ans maintenant, j'ai trois enfants et la politique, évidemment que c'est des politiques qui sont mises de l'avant pour vous aider dans vos vies, pour faire du Canada un pays plus juste, plus égal pour tout le monde qui vit ici. Mais c'est aussi une grande aventure humaine et ça me touche énormément quand je vous rencontre. Je sais qu'on se connaît pas personnellement, mais j'aimerais ça pouvoir vous regarder dans les yeux et vous dire merci à chacun pour tout ce que vous faites dans vos vies au quotidien pour aider les gens autour de vous. 
pour vous aider vous-même, parce qu'on est une grande famille. On est une grande famille. On va s'entraider que dans les moments difficiles, on va en sortir gagnant. On compte sur vous autres parce que le travail est juste commencé et on vous aime beaucoup. Merci. Merci, Sophie. Vraiment, on est, on est euh, dans une période électorale et on a toujours, comme toujours, euh, un choix très important à faire. Euh, on a pu investir euh, dans les aînés, dans les familles, euh, dans les communautés au cours des dernières années. On a pu démontrer une croissance économique forte parce qu'on a fait le choix d'investir, d'augmenter le supplément de revenus garanti pour nos aînés les plus vulnérables. Et on s'engage d'ailleurs à augmenter la sécurité de vieillesse de 10 pour tout le monde qui a 75 ans et plus. Parce qu'on sait qu'une société devrait prendre soin de ceux qui l'ont bâti, cette société, et c'est ce que vous êtes. Et, et donc, on continue de choisir d'investir, mais on comprend aussi à quel point c'est important de protéger les générations futures, nos enfants, nos petits-enfants, nos arrières, nos petits-enfants. Euh, et donc, nous allons euh, continuer de lutter contre les changements climatiques protéger notre environnement pour que euh, les futures générations aient les capacités de voir et d'apprécier euh, euh, ce magnifique pays euh, comme nous l'avions été. Mais pour ça, ça prend, nous l'avions pu. Euh, pour nous, ça prend euh, une équipe forte pour le faire. Et on a besoin de Marie-Chantal au gouvernement pour pouvoir continuer à travailler, à lutter, à livrer contre les changements climatiques. Une dernière chose que je veux dire, je sais euh, que souvent, euh, il y a des, des conversations sur euh, c'est quoi le meilleur vote pour un Québécois. Et le Bloc québécois est toujours là pour dire qu'il faut être fier, il faut voter pour le Québec, il faut voter pour le Bloc québécois. Mais excusez-moi, mais c'est pas juste le Bloc québécois qui a le monopole sur la fierté québécoise. Je suis très fier d'être québécois. Et pour moi, la place des Québécois... C'est au gouvernement pour aider à mener le pays dans le bon sens, pour lutter euh, pour les droits des femmes, pour lutter contre, contre les changements climatiques, pour continuer à investir. Et on a besoin de Québécois et Québécoises fortes au gouvernement pour pouvoir passer nos valeurs à travers le Canada, à travers le monde. Et j'espère pouvoir compter sur vous pendant qu'on choisit d'avancer ensemble. Thank you very much, everyone. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau campaigning in Quebec, meeting with seniors there, and his wife, Sophie Grégoire Trudeau, also speaking on the microphone and now uh, greeting seniors as well. And the camera seems to be uh, following her and uh, not the leader of the Liberal Party at the moment, which is interesting. So uh, there you have it, the latest campaign appearance. And we've certainly seen an increase in the number of campaign appearances each day by the various party leaders. They are trying to go from one community to another, stop in as many places as they can, talk to as many people as possible, and, uh, and quite often repeat the same messages over and over again to local audiences. Right. The, the, the campaign right now is very much focused on getting people to the polls. And when the, the results in the polls are as tight as they are, that's going to matter a lot to all the parties. Yeah, so uh, let's come back to this tweet by Barack Obama. Um, I'm, I'm racking my brain trying to remember another instance where a uh, former U.S. president has offered an opinion on how Canadians should vote in a federal election. Uh, I can't remember an example of that. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it's not something that would have happened on social media until social media became a thing. But even, you know, I mean, American presidents, and you see the tweet that Barack Obama has sent in the last hour or so, uh, saying he was proud to work with Justin Trudeau as president and saying the world needs his progressive leadership now and I hope our neighbors to the north support him for another term, um, using the American spelling of neighbors, of course. Um, <laughs> and, and term, because we don't really have them. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty solid and clear endorsement and even almost advice to Canadians there not just uh, an expression of an opinion, right? I hope our, le our neighbors to the north support him for another term. Um, Full-on endorsement, yeah. 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 That, uh, again, I, I can't think of uh, another example where an ex-president doing an interview has said, well, I'd really like to see 
Jean Chrétien uh, get elected, or I'd really like to see Brian Mulroney get elected. I, I think in some cases we knew Bill Clinton was friends with Jean Chrétien, mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan, Reagan and George Bush, the, the first President Bush, were friends with with Brian Mulroney. Brian Mulroney even spoke at the funeral of, of uh, President Bush. Uh, so we know that there were friendships there, but uh, but they didn't necessarily go this far. I think it's also interesting the way in which they phrased about progressive leadership in the world, because I think there's a lot of questions in certain circles who are concerned about foreign affairs when it comes to kind of the state of where things are at right now with Brexit going on in the UK and um, you know some of the, the coalition problems in Italy, for example, um, the situation going on in Turkey, that there doesn't seem to be enough um, of the progressive leaders uh, who are left around the table. Angela Merkel is on her way out, uh, is another one. So I think it, it, for someone who is concerned with uh, foreign affairs and foreign policy, I think it's, it's interesting to see the tweet phrased in that particular way as well. Yeah. Yeah, Go I, ahead, I was just going to say, uh, it, I'd be interested to find out if the liberals got a heads up that, that, that Obama was going to tweet this or if they coordinated the tweet with him or how, just how this went down, if he just yeah. proactively, my buddy I have JT, a hard time believing Barack Obama did that without talking to the liberals yeah, first. Yeah, I'm sure right? he did. I, or yeah. at least gave them a heads up. So I'd be interested yeah. to know behind the scenes how this played out. Because if, uh, if, if Barack Obama genuinely, genuinely wants to help Justin Trudeau and wants to see him elected to another term as prime minister then um, he he wouldn't want to do something he wouldn't want to take the risk of doing something without checking first right mm -hmm. that might provoke a backlash or something else so you yeah. Think, yeah yeah, you think. yeah. Uh, I imagine uh, you know I'm speculating here but it probably was a conversation along the lines of how can I help and the liberals probably figured given how popular Barack Obama is in Canada and uh, given the blackface scandal earlier in the campaign and given that the greatest threat to the Liberals winning the election is a surging NDP, that if Barack Obama could help bring some more progressive voters over to Justin Trudeau, bring them back in some cases, uh, that that was, that was a shot worth taking. Yeah, it's entirely pl uh, plausible, yeah. actually. Yeah. But you wonder how Canadians will view that again, an American. And I know it's not. It depends on the American president, right? But yeah. But it is an American, a former American president, telling Canadians how to vote effectively. I guess if if there's any American president who would do this, that would be, it would be a palatable move yeah. to a, a large number of Canadians. Sure. It would probably be him. I uh, want to squeeze in a call from Gail in uh, Vancouver. Gail, go ahead. Well, hello. To answer your question, who will win the most seats, the truth is that none of us knows. I don't know. The panel doesn't know. You don't know. That is true. Uh, Just trying to have a little fun my, here, Gail. Yep. My <laughs> hope is that it reflects the popular vote, and I wish we weren't having this conversation. And is the expression, the chickens have come home to roost, because the Liberal government overruled the recommendations of the Committee on Electoral Reform. We would be having a totally different conversation. All right, thank you for your call, Gail. Shelley in New Westminster, British Columbia. Hello, Shelley. Hi, Mark. Hi, go ahead. Hi, panel, great panel. You're doing a really good job covering the election. Thank you. <laughs> With your show, and you have excellent panels. Um, yeah, my view is that we're going, to, we're going to end up very much like a replay of the BC election 2017. In the polls, BC Liberals, they're not Liberals, they're Conservatives, by the way, and the NDP were neck and neck. And we ended up with, well, it was a hung parliament, basically, and Christy Clark tried to form government by bringing in a clone throne speech that ripped off a lot of the NDP's platform. People saw through that and she went to the Lieutenant Governor and she couldn't form government. Plecus. Now it's going to be interesting when we have a hung parliament after the election, who's going to be Speaker because Ple Darrell Plecus, he skipped from the Liberals and he went, he, he went against the Liberals' wishes, the, the leading BC Liberals right. wishes, and he went to be Speaker, and that really threw, spoke in the works for Christy Clark. She came out from the Lieutenant Governor's meeting 
saying one thing when it was she misinterpreted, she completely misconstrued and misled people over what the lieutenant governor said. And then the lieutenant governor said to John Hogan, can you form government? He talked to B.C. Greens. B.C. Greens could not stomach working with B.C. Liberals, the Conservatives. And so that's the end of right. the story. Now so you, you think a, very, a similar scenario strong. could play out in, in Ottawa? Yes. I okay. think that's what's going to happen. Blanchett okay. will not join with the Conservatives. Now, the wild cards are going to be Jody wilson Raybolt if she wins independency, and uh, Maxine Bernier, Jane Philpott. Now, if they're three independents, they might carry a bit of weight. Right. Okay. I already voted Mark. I voted NDP. All right, if Shelley. I'm in a safe NDP riding. Thank you very Otherwise, much for your call. I would call. have voted Liberal if it was neck and neck between Liberal and NDP. I might have voted Liberal, but I'm in a safe NDP riding. Okay. Peter Julian's great. Anyway, thanks for listening. Thank you for your call, Shelley. Uh, let's take a call from Marty in Hamilton, Ontario. Hello, Marty. Hi, gentlemen. How are you doing? Good, thank you. I'll do it real quick because there's more callers. I would like to see the Fibrils, who I vote for. Uh, I'd like to see them get just one seat or two sheets short of a majority. I'd like to see Jagmeet Singh, who I finally voted for NDP because he's the only one that wants to tax the rich. And uh, I'd like to see him hold the balance of power to see if we get the Fibrils to start taxing their friends. And number two, could the gentleman uh, comment on how they feel this democracy is when they don't pay taxes? the rich and they take the money from us being capitalists and buying and purchasing. What is it about every government that does not want to tax these people? We'd be in surplus. At least we'd be flat would not have any money owing for the thirty billion they want to spend. Uh, uh, Miss May and Jack Ming Singh turned around and showed how fourteen billion dollars was given away to the richest of the rich, six billion for giving another loans, and let's face the money. Thirty billion they're almost there on those two counts there. Could you comment on how it is okay. this country gets away with it? Thank you very much for your call. Uh, we, we can make a quick comment about that. I'd, uh, when you talk to economists, of course, it's, it's not quite so simple, right? There, uh, there is the reality that um, if you increase taxes on the rich, many of them will find ways to, to uh, move their their finances or even their residency uh, somewhere else, right? Right, and I think the other thing that we need to point out is that the imp the plan that J Jagmeet Singh has put forward in terms of this super wealth tax <laughs> is based on an American concept. Americans tax by households, and that is what this proposal is doing. Canada, we tax individual incomes, and so we can't just graft this onto our existing tax mm. system. In order to make that work, we would have to write an entirely new tax code to make that work. Yeah, and people, when you change the rules, people's behavior changes too, right? So it's not, and I'm not, that, that doesn't mean it's a bad idea to tax the rich, but it does mean that it might not be as simple as it looks, that you simply change the percentage and you collect a whole bunch more revenue. Right? And yeah, the revenues that, that both the Greens and, and the NDP are, are projecting, and maybe to a certain extent the Liberals as well, with these higher taxes, with these new types of yeah. taxes, are have been deemed highly uncertain. So we can't depend on those revenues right. being as large as they are potentially, as large All as right. they're projected to be potentially. Yeah. All right, Alex Dale, thank you very much for being part of Have Your Say today. Thanks Enjoy the rest of the campaign. You too. And uh, in the next portion of the program, we are going to be asking for your thoughts on Indigenous issues in the election. But if you're on the line now and still want to make a comment on anything we've talked about so far, we will try to get to as many of your calls as we can. Again, call us with your thoughts at one 296 2722 Send us a comment online using hashtag CPACVote2019 or email us at haveyoursay at cpac.ca. Let's take a closer look now at how Indigenous issues and the leaders have been playing out in this campaign. So not all polls are the same. How do you read them? Well, I've got five tips that I think will help. The first is be skeptical of all polls. Polls are snapshots in time. They're only capturing what Canadians are thinking at any one moment. And as we all know, Canadians can change their minds. And so 
therefore the polls become stale and don't really represent what people are thinking. Number two is polls are imperfect. They are not perfect ways of measuring. And so if one poll says the Liberals are at 32 and the Conservatives are at 33, uh, it could be that those are reversed. There's a margin of error for a reason. Three, the horse race is not the most important thing, especially early in a campaign. More important, how do Canadians feel about the country, feel about their own uh, issues? How do they feel about the leaders? Those are things that often give us an insight where this campaign might go. Number four, likelihood is more important than certainty. Polls give us a sense of where people might go. They cannot predict the future. And so when you read the numbers, um, and it says that this is a close race. The election may not end up being close as more and more people change their minds. And lastly, the design of the survey matters. How the poll was done, how many people did they interview, what days of the week uh, was it conducted, all have an impact not only on the quality of the survey, but on our ability to predict or anticipate um, where voters will be even two, three days down the road. In what year did Indigenous peoples gain the unconditional right to vote in federal elections? 1950, 1960, or 1970? 1970. 1970? I concur. 1960. My bet would be 1970. 70. 1960. It's 1960. Boom. Boom. The 1960s began with First Nations people finally receiving the franchise without having to renounce their Indian status and treaty rights. Inuit and other non-status people actually received the federal vote in 1950, but many had no way to exercise that right. It wasn't until the 1962 election that ballot boxes arrived in Inuit communities. The Leaders Tour is the name for the journey each of the main political party leaders take during the course of the campaign. The leaders are accompanied by journalists and TV networks who report on the daily stops, platform announcements, or party rallies. Which province was the first to give all Indigenous peoples the right to vote? British Columbia. I was going to say Ontario. Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, Nova Scotia. Your choices are? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Saskatchewan, Manitoba, or British Columbia? Mm. Western. I'm going to go with BC. Yeah, I agree with her. Saskatchewan, I don't know. British Columbia. It's British Columbia. Good. <laughs> you got it right, man. <laughs> Thanks. Through enfranchisement, Indigenous people could give up their Indian status and vote in federal elections as far back as 1867. First Nations have also faced challenges in becoming fully recognized citizens. It was not until 1949 that they were permitted to vote in British Columbia's provincial elections without conditions and without losing status, making BC the first province to do this. The last province to follow suit was Quebec in 1969. As Indigenous people, we grow up with three things, learning three things, don't talk, don't feel, don't trust. Yep. And able to even understand that in your own life without realizing it is a big thing, being self-aware and understanding this is how, what I learned growing up. Mm -hmm. And that's a barrier for a lot of Indigenous people is being able to understand themselves and what is actually affecting them. And education is a big when you, uh, influencer for a better life for a lot of us. a leader to... Uh, to really focus on, on our poverty and the intellectual side of it. Like our children are not learning in grade eight or grade one to eight. They're not learning anything that's gonna help them have any self, self identity. We need more leadership to focus on 
uh, getting to us, getting reaching yes. out to us youth that Related. are in the inner city yeah. that Actually, have no self worth. I grew up on reserve my whole life, other than coming to school for education, and. Never once did I ever see any leaders coming to parade in our reserve, even during election, just maybe recently, five years ago, that they started coming into the communities and coming to boast about what they're, they're promising. Why don't they come in there when there's no election? Working in, in the system for the last 17 years, I've seen so many kids uh, lost to the system, mm -hmm. lost to the gangs, lost to the, to the welfare system, yeah. lost to suicide. You know, I've, I've uh, experienced all that raising these boys for the last 17 years. I've seen what the government Can, does, not. does for them and what the government doesn't do for them. And I see what the, what the government could do for them. Yes, and, not just and helping one person, but the family, because everybody's hurting. It is time once again to have your say on CPAC. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Thank you for joining us. Our question to you this hour, how important are Indigenous issues in this election? If you have a comment, please call us right now at 1-877-296-2722 or tweet us at CPAC underscore TV. You can also send us an email at haveyoursay at cpac.ca. It hasn't been a major theme on the campaign trail. I think that is fair to say. Federal leaders were asked about Indigenous issues, though, in both the French and English language debates. So let's take a look at some of what they said. There are many uh, areas in the, uh, in the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women report that Conservatives have been calling for for uh, quite a while, including combating human trafficking, something that is very important. Uh, also, we support uh, preserving Indigenous languages by ensuring that the federal government uh, does what it can to prevent some of the, uh, the languages that are at risk of, uh, uh, of being lost uh, from be to, 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 to preserve them. Uh, when we're talking about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we need to remember that when when you talk about free, prior, and informed consent, that leaves a great deal of uncertainty about what that means. And there are large numbers of Indigenous communities who want these energy projects to succeed, and we need certainty and clarity around that. All right, we, are, we will now go to Ms. May. Natasha Megwich, it's an ex extremely important question and Greens across the country are united in this. We will honour the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It must be brought into law in this country and our existing web of laws and regulations which were properly described by the inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women as constituting structural violence must be reviewed and brought up to the standard of the United Nations Declaration. We must bring in the recommendations of the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's not a short-term project. It is on us as settler, Canadian, settler Canadians to bring justice. Monsieur, Monsieur Bonchard. Yes, we also support the declaration of the United Nations on the rights of Indigenous people. I do believe, and I've spent the most beautiful moments of this campaign with people from the First Nations. They are nations, as well as Canada is a nation and Quebec is a nation. And a nation does not put its, its culture, its language, its heritage in the hands of another nation. So what they ask for, and they have to ask, because we are not, you know, we are no better than they are to represent themselves, is that all those reports and inquiries and declarations bring something real and respectful for them. And in fact, if we're going to talk about respect, I respect, I visited Grassy Narrows and they have a mercury poisoning problem there, but Mr. Trudeau at a private event made fun of someone who was an advocate saying that their water was poisoned. What are you going to do about it? And he said, thanks for your donation. It's incomprehensible how someone could do that. If you had visited that community and seen the impact of that poisoning on people's bodies, how people are trembling because of that intoxication, that poisoning, I have no words for it. It's, it's incredible. We're going to start Stop uh, this three-way debate now. Mr. Trudeau, uh, you've been asked a very specific question. I'll give you 30 seconds to answer. 
Thank you. We have made huge investments in indigenous communities across the country and with the community of Grassy Narrows. We are working with them to approve a treatment center and we will make sure that the funding is in place for that treatment center. So that's what the leaders were saying during the televised debates. So let's talk about Indigenous issues and the extent to which they have been covered in this election campaign. Joining us this hour are Mia Rabson, a reporter for the Canadian Press, Stephen Marr, a contributing editor for Maclean's, Veldon Coburn, a University of Ottawa professor of Indigenous Studies, and Rose LeMay, CEO of the Indigenous Reconciliation Group. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being part of this discussion. Thank you for having Good us. Good afternoon, Mark. Nice and Rose, let's start with you. Um, what would you say about the extent to which Indigenous issues have been discussed during the 2019 federal election campaign? I guess I would say that I'm disappointed. I'm truly disappointed in the lack of time and quality and depth that really the that each of the platforms has touched on. The Liberal platform is is long. It looks a lot like the one from 2015. Can't hold anything against that. They have a lot of knowledge around how to write platforms, having written for the previous government. Um, but I'm actually more concerned around the, the lack of depth on it. It's it's not enough to simply say we're committed to reconciliation. I think it's time and it's a morally the right time to start talking about concrete actions before the UN community, the international community starts to really to call us to task. So are you saying that the, the, this area is, pro is not one necessarily where the, uh, the parties have, have put a lot of emphasis and attention and, and put a lot of thought into their platforms compared to some other areas, for example? I would say yes. I don't think Indigenous topics, Indigenous Canadians and their views have been captured in the platforms to date. Certainly there is enough, there's a lot of text, I can't disagree with some of the texts that are in, certainly the NDP platform, Liberal platform, but uh, my concern is really around the lack of depth and the lack of costed, reasonable costing on them. I don't also see much going on at a local riding level. That may just be in my riding, I can't, I don't have the knowledge to look around acro across the country, but I, I just I wonder if if it's been fully thought through in terms of concrete action. The, we're done with words. This cannot continue with just the words. We need the action. Feldman? I agree completely, especially around discussions on the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because there are a lot of token gestures towards acknowledging that, but um, some of the parties, especially the Conservatives, who uh, I guess only in recent days had acknowledged that, well, they were the ones that held up the uh, passage of Romeo Saganash's private members bill through the Senate to let it die when Parliament dissolved, is that um, that was a key tenant within the uh, National Inquiry into Missing Murder of Indigenous Women and Girls. Is their final report is they open up with it in fact is that one of the principles to addressing this is the acknowledgement and, and not necessarily enshrining it within statutory uh, instruments but actually enshrining it within the Constitution that it would be something recognized under section 35 explicitly that's a very vague section right of the Constitution that's always been ch uh, challenged or at least addressed before the courts nobody knows what section 35 rights are until it's been addressed but this is the one that they wanted in there and again this is a, a party that may not necessarily um, be warm to that at all so that's a key tenet for reconciliation I guess that um, that um, I guess has been sort of overlooked uh, a lot of the other parties say yes we're going to adopt it but adopt it how and are they going to honor that national inquiries final record well, one of the opening recommendations in fact right um, but by and large, yes, I'm, I'm almost in agreement that the, the issues of Indigenous issues have uh, failed to register as much as we might like them to. We saw this in the first debate that within moments, Indigenous issues went right towards pipelines. So there was that sort of, do they coexist or are they coextensive with, with one another? So it, it, was, it was sort of disappointing to see uh, a panel of non-Indigenous people say, this is actually what we think of when we think of Indigenous peoples. Right. Mm -hmm. Mia, why do you think we haven't talked more about these issues during this election campaign? 
I think honestly, it's about it's about vote numbers. That's the only thing that that I can think of that would compel the parties, none of them really, to to approach it. I believe Jagmeet Singh did go to to Grassy Narrows, made a stop there. Justin Trudeau is the only leader that's going anywhere near the Arctic and any of any of the territories, visiting any Inuit communities. None of the other leaders are going there. Uh, it's like it's just it's almost like they just don't see that as part of their path to victory. Because if they thought that it was their path to victory, you know that they would be out there talking visiting and and because we're not seeing that that's that's the only thing I can think of is they don't think that it's part of their path to victory right uh, Stephen do you think there's that's any different from 2015 I think it may be a little different because I think the the, the, the Liberal Party in 2015 uh, part of their pitch to voters was that they were going to bring a different approach to reconciliation. Uh, and one of the reasons why they may be less enthusiastic to talk about that now is because of the in the SNC Lamelin affair with the the departure from cabinet of uh, Jody Wilson Raybould, you see uh, a 10 percent law uh, change for the worse in Justin Trudeau's approval rating. So that that's something that uh, is is a challenge, I think, for him. That that any time that he talks about the the progress that the Liberals have made on reconciliation, people can re immediately say his critics can immediately say, well, what about you know you hypocrite? What about Jody Wilson-Raybould? Right. So, Rose, how would you assess uh, Justin Trudeau compared to what he promised uh, in the 2015 election? There were a number of promises made in 2015 election, and it very much resonated with with the people that I've talked to, First Nations, Inuit, Métis. Uh, there probably, I don't think it's unsafe to say that there is uh, a, a lot of sadness around the lack of action on all of those words. Uh, the missing and murdered Indigenous woman inquiry, that seemed to be a little bit of a band-aid. The report, the final report, is certainly we're going to work on it and, and make some action on it. I, I think. Uh, there are so many different examples that there was a lot of words, there was just enough money in order to really just kind of maintain a, a bit of a silence. Drinking water, for example, not nearly enough money to make a difference. But it's a good way in order to show just a little bit of progress and is there an art to just making just enough progress to look like we met our commitments. I, I, I worry about commitments now, let's just say that. Right. Uh, Veldon, uh, Justin Trudeau is sometimes accused of uh, being uh, uh, high on symbolism mm -hmm. uh, without necessarily following through with actions. Is this an area where you think Indigenous people feel that uh, that, that um, criticism applies? I think so, definitely. Um, I, I think uh, there was a poll done by CBC just in late June, just around Canada Day, and they released it as that uh, the support and it was almost historic in terms of uh, indigenous turnout especially on reserve that um, and that's just an indication of of it larger because we can't tell what they did off reserve and it doesn't capture Métis settlements or, or Inuit is that it had increased by about 14 and a half percent typically they poll about 47 percent but they were about 61 percent turnout and Justin Trudeau and the Liberals garnered over 40 percent of the support from indigenous peoples now that political capital that they invested within the Liberal Party, um, very historic and again kind of coming on the heels of nine and a half years of, uh, of kind of a cold government that you know was, was, was cold at best, maybe antagonistic at worst of the Harper years, coming out um, to invest that political capital again in, in the Liberals who had a message of hope and reconciliation. And again this was in 2015 too, so a few months after the release of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report. So there was a lot um, of movement from 2013, 2014 in Idle No More, of resistance against one particular party that had held government and to, to react against that and then um, a platform which did have historic investments as well. So this year the budgets, the Liberals put in um, I, I guess almost 19 billion dollars in Indigenous investment, more than any before but also falling short of what sort of expected to uh, to close considerable gaps that are actually growing. So um, there is sort of the the great promises but falling short of that and, and I don't think Indigenous peoples are going to be putting their votes behind it as they did in 2015. Right. Child welfare is a perfect example of, of something that the, that the Liberals went into to this their government saying we were going to make improvements and they had a human rights tribunal that was that came early on in their government and said we're not you, you aren't the, the Canadian government is not doing right by these children you need to do better and they sort of 
improved and they put a little money and they did a little bit more and then the trade wheel said no you're not doing well enough they were order after order after order saying you're not doing enough to fulfill this order they finally came down just before the election started and said you actually now owe compensation to these children and the government's appealing the ruling they're saying it's because they can't do it during well during caretaker the december deadline but they're still appealing it and it's it's the symbol at the for a government that loves symbols that is definitely not being being uh, played very well in their favor Stephen, uh, when you look at the platforms of the parties in this election campaign, uh, it, is there anything that stands out there? Is there a party that is promising more or is more inclined towards action? Um, I, I don't see a lot in any of the, the platforms that stands out as uh, proposing a, a completely new approach or something strikingly different. Uh, it's interesting that the Conservatives have, a, have an appeal uh, to have a kind of new a minister for consultations around natural resource development projects. And one question that I'm left with in this campaign, we see during all the debates when asked about Indigenous issue, Mr. Shear pivots to natural resource development. Uh, and um, it's interesting, uh, does he feel that there's a constituency among Indigenous voters who, who support that? That's a voice that we don't often hear. Uh, and so that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, uh, uh, I think the grassy narrows. Uh, Mr. Singh's comments, I thought, struck an emotional chord that most people can agree with, that that was absurd for the Prime Minister to make the, the wise crack that he did with those protesters. And it's ridiculous and um, tragic that the circumstances in, in grassy narrows are as they are. Uh, I thought also Mr. Singh made a, um, a, a, an excellent point in um, one of the debates, uh, or in a scrum, when asked about uh, uh, spending money on improving drinking water and saying, well, would you be asking if that's a, a good use of money if it was the drinking water in Toronto or Montreal? Right. Something I, that I have, uh, have believed for years that it's sort of strange that we accept this as normal in First Nations communities in a way that we would not in other communities. Right, asking about value for money when it's, when it's a basic resource yeah uh, and as as he pointed out I don't think if there were, if the if the electricity went out in in Winnipeg or Vancouver or Edmonton or Toronto or Halifax and and it took a lot of money to restore it uh, people wouldn't be asking about the price tag they'd be asking when is it going to be up and running again well it's happening in, in Winnipeg right now or yeah. Manitoba right now with, yeah. with snow nobody's asking how much it's going to cost a, they're asking when in yeah. a way in this campaign those comments from Mr. Singh are probably the the most important emotional arguments that anyone has made during the campaign and it's striking that uh, and I wonder if we won't see an electoral result for that with indigenous voters that this that the leader who has spoken out most forcefully and empathetically on these issues was has been Jagmeet Singh yeah I might say, Mark, that uh, yeah, getting back to Stephen's point is probably the only innovative, and I'd, 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 I'd be careful to say it's innovative in any way, because I think there's a dual purpose to it, is the establishment of that new minister of portfolio. One, Indigenous people don't need another minister overseeing uh, this government, the federal uh, liberals here, had split INAC into two, so we have two Indigenous ministers now and to create a third. But I think it goes back to the first debates where there was that inflammatory language from Andrew Scheer who mentioned that, well, we can't have one segment or one group of, of Canadian society holding the rest hostage. So this is sort of his chief uh, or crown hostage negotiator, the one that is going to consult Indigenous people on their rights. So it may appease those who are concerned about resource development to say, there will be a bureaucratic liaison, or actually there will be a cabinet liaison in between the two to bridge them. So I can appease those in Saskatchewan and our sort of conservative rich base of Alberta who are worried about First Nations who may, you know, mm. hold them hostage. And, uh, and also to Indigenous rights holders and say, look, I'm going to address your concerns as those that, uh, that may have that particular interest as well. Directly at pipelines as well, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this is the this is his, one of Mr. Shear's big things is trying to get more pipelines built. And the one pipeline that they've been trying, the the Conservatives couldn't get it couldn't get a pipeline through because Indigenous consultations weren't were deemed insufficient. And then the Conservatives and Liberals sort of their cons consultations together were deemed insufficient for the Trans Mountain pipeline. He wants more pipelines. He sort of knows that if they want more pipelines, they have to figure out a solution. So this is aimed entirely at pipelines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's see what our viewers think about this. Marge is calling from Abbotsford, British Columbia. Hello, Marge. Hi. Hi. Um, I just have a 
maybe three things just to comment on. Um, first of all, I, I just want to talk um, real quick about Barack Obama's tweet. Um, I just wish the panel, I wish you guys wouldn't try pull it apart and dissect it and did the liberals call him and blah, 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 blah. I think Trudeau and Obama had a very good relationship. And I think Obama has good relationships with people over around the world. Um, secondly, I learned more in the last four years about indigenous people than I had ever known in my lifetime. Um, and because I watch CPAC a lot. And the liberals have done. I just want to ask you, what have the conservatives done when they were in power over the 10 years that they had? I mean, this is a big, big issue, and it's going to take a lot to solve it. But I think if everybody could just sort of back down a little bit and, you know, give it time, because they do, if they do have another four years, they do have things in places. And I know the conservatives and everybody's talking about their promises, but are they promises that they're going to keep, or is it just to get votes? I don't know what you guys think about that, but... Um, like I said, I'm 65 years old. I've learned so much. I have more respect for the Indigenous people than I've ever had before because I didn't realize what they were going through. But I, I, am, I do support what the government's doing. I don't know. Yeah, don't now know when you think. say, though, uh, not to pick which is one thing that you're saying, but when you say give it time, uh, would you understand why members of the Indigenous community are already Oh, yeah, I, I realize they want things done quickly and it should be but there's so many issues when you're in government i mean if you put all of your um people just dealing with that nothing else would get done um i i the conservatives for 10 years did absolutely now nothing and now we've got andrew Shear out there going well we'll do this we'll do that are they really going to do it or are these just promises Okay, thank you very much for your call, Marge. Jeff is in Victoria. Hello, Jeff. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Um, um, my first thing I would say is it's really like, like, like to kind of in the you know, a little bit in line with your last caller is like when I was, I know when I was in school, like, like elementary school and, um, and junior high and high school and all that, I never, n never really learned much about Aboriginal issues other than. Uh, other other than okay we basically in the beginning we put them on reservations and, and and we have this thing called the Indian Act and that was about the extent that I that, that I do we you never really got into any depth on it but the, but I think part of the problem too and I'll use the pipeline issue as an example like with, within the Aboriginal community itself there's a lot of politics like there's some groups that are angry with other uh, Aboriginal group because Oh, our band is totally for the pipeline, and this group, this other group, is totally against it, and what, and 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 that kind of sends a confusing message to to, to government. And I think p the real issue that we have to deal with it is work with Aboriginals and open up the Constitution, modernize the Indian Act in parts where where it's really racist and really outdated, especially in like like when it comes to Aboriginal consultation. Like, like, say on projects and other things. It doesn't have to necessarily be a resource product, but any project. Like, like, when are we? Le when is the government legally, legally, met the criteria of, of consulting with the Aboriginals so it's final? Because, because we're, it seems like out of out of the woodwork, we always get at the end of the day, we always get one Aboriginal group, maybe out of. I don't know, thousands, I don't know how many there are that, that, that comes out of the work and said, oh, we weren't properly consulted enough, even though, even though, even though technically the majority of, uh, of them were, it, it seems, seems like an endless cycle, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's frustrating when, when we don't know what, where we've met that obligation because it, because it frustrates people. And I also okay. think that, that when the... Um, when the Election is over. I th I think there'll be and Parliament has figured out like like how it's going to work and all that. I think there'll be more dealing with Aboriginal issues than than what we've been able to do on this campaign due to the nature of 
uh, of the possibilities, the mathematics of the election. Okay, thank you for your call, Jeff. Uh, let's get some reaction. Uh, Rose, your response to those two calls? I, I appreciate the viewpoints, and I think they're very good questions and to ask the, the country, not only the federal government, though. Some of the questions that we're asking about are also involve the province and territory. I appreciate both the calls were from British Columbia, and we should actually be looking for the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation in BC. They're making significant progress on implementing a United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That's probably somebody we should be looking at as a role model. Around consultation, whenever humans get together, boy, do we ever know how to fight well, don't we? Hmm. Provinces and territories, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, full consensus is, is pretty rare for us in this country. Uh, it's a, and we are strong because of the diversity. Are we ever going to achieve 100% perfection on consultation? No. Should we shoot for it? We should try hard to do as well we can. We are never all going to be on the same point on most issues. Right. And uh, to some extent, there's, there's a risk, obviously, of uh, spending so much time on process that you're not making any progress on basic fundamental issues, right? Right. I'd, I'd actually, yeah, say, I can't say it any actually better than that. And I think Mia had mentioned uh, one of the issues where it has been stalled procedurally is actually through eight non-compliance orders in the Human Rights Tribunal uh, for um, observing and, and guaranteeing the human rights of Indigenous children. Um, that goes back to the first call as well to, you know, I do appreciate that, that, you know, in the last four years, most Canadians have waken up to the fact that uh, their neighbours and their friends, people that go to school with their children are Indigenous, that they don't accept the conditions of those, their loved ones, their neighbourhood, and that they won't accept that any longer, but um, four years, I guess, when the Human Rights Commission comes out and says, hey, this is how it goes, or the Human Rights Tribunal, rather, this is how it goes, and they stall procedurally, is that children who die within that sort of small period of time, that's, we don't have time to wait. Yeah. And I think you, you come back, I come back to the question you asked earlier about why we haven't seen more from the parties. And it very likely is, is because these issues and these concerns have not made it onto the voting concerns or voting issues for non-Indigenous indigenous Canadians. If Canadians in downtown Toronto, non-Indigenous Canadians in downtown Toronto and Vancouver and Winnipeg and Halifax were all demanding these things get improved, the leaders would start to listen. When it's only coming from the Indigenous communities themselves, the leaders don't feel as compelled to listen. And so we have not made that leap in Canada yet. One, one of the colleagues mentioned the uh, Indian Act. If you look at the, at the history of the Indian Act, I'm from Nova Scotia, and uh, if you, um, a key moment in the history of Indigenous uh, federal government relations in Nova Scotia was the Marshall decision, where judges found that since Confederation, basically, the federal government had been ignoring its obligations in the treaties. And I think that that's a sort of story that you'll find repeated across Canada. So the problems that we're having with consultation now, I think, can be understood historically as a, a, a step around the federal government and non-Indigenous people coming to grips with the fact that we have treaty obligations and we don't have proper structures and, and uh, in order to recognize those. And there's a sort of, I suspect, real reconciliation is moving away from uh, relying on judges to enforce the treaties into uh, a more cooperative relationship. But how you get there and whether any politicians have any answers on that, I don't know. I'm not hearing mm -hmm. it in this campaign. Mm -hmm. All right, we are interested in your opinions on this, and we will get back to your phone calls in just a few moments. But we also took our cameras to the streets of Ottawa. Let's hear a couple of questions for our panel from people in Ottawa. Well, it seems to me that we, um, as a country, we do put a lot of money towards Indigenous is issues. And it seems that e even though we do that, we're, they're not getting resolved. We're still the water issues, the water crisis, um, something from my understanding, this is what I don't know, but it seems that um, the money goes to the chiefs of the, of the territories, or whatever they're called, and they spend it at their discretion. And it doesn't seem to have a lot of control once the money leaves the government. I always hear from the news all the negative stuff about uh, all the suffering they, they faced. And for me, it's always like we earn 
2020 right now, 2019, how is that still happening? I cannot believe it, but sometimes I don't understand why can't we fix the problem? I mean, we know all the problems they had, all the troubles they went through, all everything that happened to them. So why, why it's taking us too long to fix it? All right, thank you for those questions. Uh, Veldin, maybe we can start with you on this. And I, I, I can understand the perspective that some people have from a distance of, mm -hmm. look, we, we keep putting money into this and it doesn't get resolved. Why is it taking so long? Why can't we just get the drinking water uh, to the reserves and so on? Uh, but obviously there's a, there's a level of complexity to this that unless you're close to it, you're, you're not going to see, right? Yeah, well, I mean, we're in this, the city where, you know, half the uh, federal dollars get gobbled up before they start going out to programs <laughs> and services, right? And uh, But there are, there are stringent controls upon the contribution agreements and, and the transfer of funds to Indigenous uh, First Nations, uh, financial reporting. It may be a little bit lax, I guess, after the federal Liberals got in, one of their... Um, I guess promises kept was to say, well, we're not going to require chiefs to report, whereas you know the significant majority of them already do voluntarily and and have their books financially checked each year. But uh, one of the issues that stands out for me, which might be indicative of why things never get done, is we look back at last May when Seamus O'Regan went up to Grassy Narrows after 50 years. It's been 50 years now of their drinking water and mercury contamination and mercury poisoning, and that he walked away without you know, I guess coming to an agreement to build the mercury poisoning treatment center. Again, um, it sounded, it feels like a political decision. Hmm. So, mm -hmm. Rose, uh, how would you answer that question of, of why it takes so long to resolve these problems? It does certainly take too long. And I wonder if it's the Ottawa bureaucracy. We don't actually have the same structures in place that a province or territory would. If the city of Kanata or Oshawa were to have a boil water advisory, a number of agencies and mandated organizations would jump in and resolve it and we would expect immediate, immediate results. My town, I live in Kanata, I, it, would, it would not be without water for I would guess more than two hours. Mm -hmm. It would be an emergency. That doesn't exist for First Nations or Inuit or Métis because this country has not seen fit to have all of that system that applies for, ca for Canadians to also support First Nations, Inuit, Métis. Uh, water treatment certification, it tends to be separate for, for First Nations and then for Inuit. Health, some of the big pan-Canadian organizations have not necessarily supported the health of First Nations, Inuit, Métis. Child welfare, we run a separate system. I'm not arguing against that, that there is a separate system but the organizations that are in play that support the quality in every provincial and territorial jurisdiction, why do they not also support the quality for First Nations Inuit right. and Métis? Now, on your Kanata example, Kanata is a suburb of Ottawa, um, th there might be some people who would say, okay, well, that's more a function of geography, right, or of population density, that if there were some small non-Indigenous community in a remote area and their water went down, it might take a long time to Such get it as fixed. maybe Walkerton? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on any given day we have, you know, three, four dozen Walkertons existing at one yeah. given time. I'm not making that no. argument, I'm just no, saying, no. you know, there, 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 there would be people saying it's, a, it's not an apples to apples comparison because you're talking about a major city in Canada uh, with a significant population density compared to a community that's in a more remote area. It, possibly. There is also some evidence to show that the stats around well-being around water, it's not the rural remote communities. It's not, it's not the communities, the flying communities necessarily. Communities also are facing issues around water treatment on paved roads, on roads, close to urban areas. And so there, there may be a function around access to the technical resources, uh, but it can't be all of that. Yeah. Feldon, what specific action do you think would would show members of the, the Indigenous community and Canadians who care about this issue that that a government is serious about this and that we're making real progress? On drinking water itself? No, on, uh, just on everything. On everything. Right? Well, yeah. I mean, all the platforms seem to go at the, uh, you know, the same lingering issues that have been going on for the last hundred years, the socio socioeconomic indicators, uh, education, health. Um, and other sort of social outcomes, uh, those gaps. But there's also the infrastructure as well, so water and wastewater, 
bringing things up to conditions that I think even compare in, uh, in comparable situations and geographies, what have you, is that other Canadians wouldn't accept for themselves. Um, one of the biggest overarching issues, though, too, is the sort of sentiment between the two sort of solitudes here is reconciliation. Is that sort of term has been floated around um, since 2015 and, and has almost been appropriated by the Liberal Party, I guess, as they slap reconciliation on you know any sort of venture as though it's a bumper sticker or a t-shirt on things that actually don't or rub against the go against the grain of, of the spirit of it it's um this, it was a, an olive branch that was offered by the survivors of Indian residential schools of their families my own families and the nations to say like let's get past this and yet um, something that's that's intangible immaterial that um, that needs to be healed that um, that seems to have, seems to have been lost, but reduced to something or cheapened a little bit. Um, mm. um, and and now, Mia, is it uh, Jagmeet Singh? I think is saying that drinking water will be resolved by 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, how? Yeah, and, and lift all advisories by then. How how realistic is that? The Liberals, I can't remember what the date was that they put on it in 2015, but they promised to end all drinking water advis advisories, and they did do some work and they there was dozens of systems that came online and that were improved as more fell offline and went off so it's it's almost this lingering problem that they haven't figured out okay we can this piecemeal approach to solving it because they keep getting more and more that, that they then have to fix sort of down the line so to say that it's going to be all fixed by 2021 Partly I find hard to believe just because I've heard it so many times before that it's yeah. going to be fixed and I don't see anything tangible on the table that's going to explain how they will actually get there. Stephen, uh, obviously uh, what we're seeing happen over and over again is political considerations being put ahead of moral obligations, right? Uh, is that effectively what the pattern is here, that uh, if there aren't votes to be won and if the budget is uh, challenged, then then it's always easy to sort of push this down the road a little bit? I think a lot of what we're talking about when you look at globally the problem uh, is that um, political parties are machines for getting votes. They, and if they're not good at that, they are unsuccessful political parties. So you can't ask them to change in a way. Uh, that's how they thrive. Um, and th the problem is that the number, amount of votes, there's about uh, uh, approximately two million indigenous people in Canada, depending on how you mm -hmm. count it. Yep. Uh, that's um, not at an election winning group, but I think that we saw in the last election that uh, with greater participation, and it can be, uh, uh, I think, a, a significant enough, there's maybe 20, 30 ridings in Canada where that can be a significant percentage right. of the vote. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. <laughs> uh, but the, the problem, so that's on one side of the scale. You have this kind of political calculation that a lot of ethnic communities yeah. think about this, this kind of how can we exert you know, influence and uh, it appears to me that this is in some ways a new way of thinking for indigenous Canadians that they uh, that there's a new sort of there used to be a lot of indigenous Canadians and say I, well I don't want to vote that's a federal system and I'm that's not part of my identity uh, so I see that as a positive change uh, on the other side of the of the scale you have the fact that of the obligations of the federal government looking after the care and well-being of for instance indigenous children uh, what is more important than that in terms of a responsibility? Looking after uh, injured veterans would be a similar sort of sense right. of scale. These are things that the federal government should have at its very core of its sense of responsibility. And there's an imbalance between the political reward from doing it and from the responsibility that the, right. par the parties and government should yeah. feel. And yet the yeah. heart heartache and the outrage in non-Indigenous communities when you hear of the tragedies that involve these kids is enormous. And then it doesn't follow up with that political desire and that political demand from those communities to say, you know what, we are going to vote on this. I want this to change. One of the uh, people who spoke on the street said, well, we we all uh, you know we keep doing things and nothing seems to happen and I wonder if the if the part of the ch problem is that in the media we don't actually talk about the fact which I believe is true is that things are getting better in many ways for many indigenous people in Canada in Nova Scotia when I go to Millbrook when I go to Mem member two those places are transformed compared to what they were like when I was a kid when they were 
tar paper shocks. Mm -hmm. And now there are thriving businesses and huge uh, improvements in educational and employment opportunities for young people in those communities. And I wonder if we are communicating that. I don't, and maybe we need to. Right. I might point out real quickly, though, to the point of uh, water and pipeline is that, I, and I know it very intimately because in 2011 I worked at INAC on water and wastewater, and that was when the largest, the, well, the single largest study of, of water systems in Canada came out, the national assessment, and the, the figure was pegged then at $4.7 billion. And to see that kind of, uh, they rolled it out, you know, under the Conservatives until 2015, and you know, just under 200 million dollars a year to try to close that while the gap was a little bit growing. But to see the Conservative, or uh, actually, sorry, uh, the Liberal government pull out 4.5 billion dollars very quickly, and you know, out of the public purse, I don't think it was actually budgeted in that budget. I guess it would go through main estimates is to buy the pipeline, whereas it could have closed the gap in terms of wastewater right. and water infrastructure. So. Okay, I want to try to squeeze in a couple more calls before we uh, go any further. Cheryl is in Edmonton. Hello, Cheryl. Hi. Hi, go ahead. Uh, that too, beyond. Okay, first of all, what I want to point out is, and I, don't, I haven't heard this listening to people talking about Indigenous, but that throughout Canada there are so many different bands of indig Indigenous people. For example, Quebec, you have the... Uh, uh, Iroquois, and you have the, you know, you have the Métis, then you have the Cherokee, and all these uh, different bands come with different concerns. So there is a big difference between the indigenous people and their needs in Quebec, for example, versus the indigenous uh, people here in Alberta, versus the indigenous people perhaps in Saskatchewan, saying that for example, now that I did live in Quebec for, well, I grew up, I was born in Quebec, but I now live in Alberta. And when I moved out here, I was amazed, literally amazed, at how the Aboriginal people here have moved ahead. They have literally got together, they've invested in hotels, in golf courses, and I was amazed at this. And this is not just minor these are four cla four star five star class hotels so cheryl i'm, I'm just together invested in just because we're short on time but cheryl then just I'm looking at quebec cheryl and i look at quebec living there for so long and i look at the abundance of resources in quebec for example hudson bay and the amount of water that they have and a lot of that water was built on indigenous people's property right so what i'm saying is that for me, when I hear these people coming out to vote, I believe that what the indigenous people have to do is un unify and become as one voice and say, okay, this is Alberta, we have, where did they get their wealth? They didn't get their wealth from the oil sands. The oil sands came later. Okay, Cheryl, I'm, I'm going to jump in because uh, we've got other calls to get to, but thank you for your call. Bob in Chilliwack, British Columbia. Hello, Bob. Okay, I promise to be real short. Okay, if we are tight we on time, have, unfortunately, but go yeah, ahead. If, if, if only we wouldn't have deliberately contained, displaced, and moved out of our way, and continue to do so in a lot of areas of this country uh, in the first place, and we wouldn't have such a long-term mess to fix. People have to recognize, people like me have to recognize, we are benefiting from our bad actions over a couple centuries now, and there may be a few of us who might not want to give that up. We just have to remember that. We are responsible because we continue to benefit from what we did to an entire people. All right, Bob, thank you very much for your call. Um, I, I understand the perspective that was raised by Cheryl, uh, but, but of course, I think it can also be said that uh, different parts of the country have different priorities, you know, among non-Indigenous voters uh, as well, right? So uh, that doesn't seem to pose a problem when parties are trying to uh, pre present a platform around which they can they can get consensus across the country. The needs of Quebecers or the need or the needs of Albertans might be different, whether they're Indigenous voters or non-Indigenous voters. Isn't that the case? Oh, absolutely. And I don't think you would expect that non-Indigenous voters vote as a block. There's you know right. there's two million Indigenous voters. We all, get, we all voters get together and figure out you know an agenda and, and agree on it <laughs> and before. And Quebec. I think that James Bay Cree is a model for indigenous people in Canada, the level of business and, you know, they have an airline, they have lots of things going on there. The first modern treaty. 
right? Yeah. So I think what that that last last caller said is really important for as well, because I hear a lot of people say, "Well, it's not me who 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 kicked them off. It's not me who did that." And but we are still benefiting from them. And treaties should mean something in this country. They didn't mean something to the people who signed them, at least the non-indigenous communities that signed them 150 years ago plus. But they should mean something to Canadians today, and sh we should feel on, uh, obligated to honor those right. th those agreements. And I think and understand what treaties actually mean. And there is a moral agreement. There, I think if there ever was one one thing that First Nations and Inuit and Métis will probably all agree on, it's yes, this country needs to do reconciliation. And we're doing it for our kids. Like what other thing would we do it for except for all of our children? And that is the one place where I think all Canadians can, can come around that, uh, that we're, we need our kids to grow up in a safe place, to access equitable health care, to have the same similar kind of access to education. I, I, I think we all agree on that. And I think yeah. Canada would be a stronger, safer place if all Canadians, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, had the same access to services and education and health care. The whole country would benefit. Yeah. Quick you, final thoughts, Stephen? Uh, we would greatly benefit from uh, having more uh, Indigenous people in the workforce, uh, yeah. and, uh, which is something that, you know, if people are not swayed by moral arguments, right. uh, we, it's the fastest growing uh, segment of the yeah. Canadian population and much better if they're working side by side with us. Thank you all. Uh, it was a very good discussion. Uh, we spent a little bit of time on it. We could have spent a lot more, but I appreciate you all uh, being part of it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks thank for having us, Mark. Pleasure. And thank you for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow on Have Your Say. Your connection to people, to communities, to our country. Your connection to the full story. CPAC, created by Cable for Canadians.